A new human study has found an easy way for us to slash our dementia risks by 15% over a four-year time period, which probably compounds to a much higher risk reduction the earlier that we start this method. So we'll unpack the study and explain how you can apply its lessons to protect your brain health. And if you want weekly health research summaries and health strategies that I share with my patients, sign up using the link in the pinned comment. The study was published just a couple of weeks ago and it involved a massive research effort carried out in China. Scientists identified about 34,000 people living in rural villages who were over 40 and had high blood pressure. They divided them into two groups. One group just got regular care from their doctors and the intervention group was put on medications with the goal of lowering their blood pressure to less than 130. The goal was to see if an aggressive approach to lowering blood pressure would affect the rates of dementia. So let me pause here for a second, because you might be wondering, what's the connection between blood pressure and dementia? Well, there are several distinct factors that can lead to dementia, but blood pressure is one of the most important, and here's why. The brain requires a large volume of blood to supply energy and oxygen. It's filled with blood vessels, many of which are tiny and sensitive. So elevated blood pressure puts stress on the whole system, and it causes several problems at once. It damages blood vessels, increases inflammation, and generates oxidative stress, which accelerates neuron aging. Plus, as the body responds to this damage over time, our vessels get stiffer and can form plaque. This makes the problem even worse, and as we age, our bodies gradually lose the ability to adjust to higher blood pressure and repair that damage. This accumulated damage to the brain is one of the root causes of dementia, so it makes perfect sense to see if lowering blood pressure can also lower our dementia risks. And it also makes perfect sense to ask what a safe blood pressure level is, and we'll return to that question in a minute because the targets have changed. So here's what the researchers in this new study discovered. At the end of the four-year period, the average blood pressure had fallen by about 30 points in the intervention group. That compared to a fall of just 8 points in the control group. So the intervention group hit their blood pressure targets of under 130. But here's the critical question. Did that make a difference when it came to dementia? And yes, it did. The intervention group had a 15% lower risk of dementia than the other group, which is an impressive result. And this impact was only after four years. So we know that damage from blood pressure is accumulative and it builds up with time. So if we aim to get our blood pressures lower over, say, a 40-year period, it's likely to have a much greater impact. But I want to return to a question that I raised a moment ago. Researchers picked a blood pressure target of 130 for the study, and getting the blood pressure below that target obviously helped the dementia risks. But does that number represent a safe level? How high is high when it comes to blood pressure? Well, two groundbreaking studies have completely changed our answer to this question. They show us that as doctors, we got it wrong. For decades, we knew that high blood pressure was dangerous, but we didn't realize just how dangerous it was, even at levels that seemed okay. For a long time, doctors believed that having a systolic blood pressure, which is the top level on your reading, up to about 140 was perfectly fine. You may have even heard your doctor say that as long as your blood pressure is under 140 on 90, that you're in the clear. We used to think that, okay, well, 120 over 80 is ideal, but 140? That's still okay, isn't it? Well, we now know that having a systolic blood pressure near 140 is actually risky. It's not just okay, it puts our lives in danger. So the reason that doctors thought that 130 is fine is because blood pressure, it tends to go up as we get older. So we figured that a little higher was normal, but new research has shown that even that little extra pressure can cause big problems. The first wake-up call came from the SPRINT study, which stands for Systolic Blood Pressure Intervention Trial. This study was massive, involving over 9,000 participants, so the findings here are hard to ignore. The goal was to see if lowering blood pressure to 120 would protect against heart attacks, strokes and other problems better than using the older target of 140. So the people in that study, they were at high risk of heart disease, but they didn't have diabetes or a history of strokes. They were split into two groups. One group aimed for a blood pressure of around 140, and the other group aimed for 120. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The results were so clear that they had to stop the study early. The study was supposed to last four to six years, but after only 3.3 years, it was obvious that lowering blood pressure to below 120 made a huge difference. There was a 27% lower risk of having a heart attack stroke or dying from these causes each year. And when it came to death rates alone, there was a 25% lower risk of dying in the group that aimed for 120. So let that sink in for a moment. A 25% reduction in risk of death just by lowering blood pressure more aggressively. That isn't just a small improvement, that's a game changer. But the story doesn't stop there. Recently, a study in China tested these findings on an even larger and more diverse group. So over 11,000 people were included and they included people with diabetes and those who had already had a stroke. 
So think of the study as the sequel to the sprint study, but with an even bigger cast. And guess what? The results were just as powerful. Lowering systolic blood pressure to less than 120 reduced the risks of heart attacks, strokes, and death from cardiovascular causes by 12%. Plus, it cut the overall risk of death by 21% over a three and a half year period. So the takeaway here is clear. The old normal of 120 is no longer good enough. The more aggressive target of 130 used in the study that we looked at isn't ideal either. Most of us should be aiming for a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 to really protect our health. Now there are nuances to this. For some patients that I see in the clinic who are older, we need to tread carefully because if we lower their blood pressure too much, we cause them to feel dizzy and lightheaded and worst case scenario, they fall. So again, there is some nuance here, but for the vast majority of patients, again, for people such as my age, only 33, 120 is ideal. But coming back to the sprint and e-sprint studies, those studies focused on heart attacks, strokes, and all-cause death rates. But what about dementia risks? Do we know anything about the safe blood pressure level specifically for that? And thanks to recent research on this question, we now do. So one study is actually a follow-up analysis of the group used in the sprint study that we looked at before. And in this new analysis, researchers looked at the risks of developing dementia. So would they find the same pattern as they did for heart attacks and strokes? Well, the pattern was the same. Those who were in the lower blood pressure group had a 14% lower chance of developing dementia during the follow-up period. That's a significant finding, and yet another study adds one more piece of evidence that points in the same direction. It found that middle-aged women with a blood pressure of between 120 and 139 had increased evidence of cognitive decline a decade later. So it wasn't yet dementia, but the indications that their brains were suffering damage. The researchers suggest that reducing blood pressure to below 120 reduces our risks of cognitive decline. So all of this gives us strong evidence that getting our blood pressure to below 120 isn't just the right target for our hearts, it's the right target for our brains too. So what can we do to lower our blood pressure to a healthy level? Well, here are five of the most important actions that we can take. The first is to lower our salt intake. So the American Heart Association recommends that we have no more than about half a teaspoon or 1,500 milligrams per day. So compare that with the 3,500 milligrams that the average American eats daily. But how significant is sodium intake because you'll hear a lot of noise on social media? Well, one study that looked at 85 different trials found a clear pattern. As sodium intake goes up, so too does blood pressure. And the reason is simple. Sodium causes your body to retain more water and increases the volume of your blood. So if there's a greater amount of fluid in your blood vessels, it makes sense that the overall pressure would increase. It's similar to how a balloon stretches tighter and tighter the more air you blow into it. A salt substitute here is a good option for some people. This is a type of salt that swaps out some of the sodium chloride in regular table salt with potassium chloride. A large study in China found that making that simple switch cut strokes and lowered overall death rates by 12% during the study period. The second thing we can do to control our blood pressure is to shift the way we eat. So researchers have developed guidelines called the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And as you can tell from the name, it's specifically designed to lower blood pressure. One analysis looked at several types of interventions to lower blood pressure and it concluded that the DASH diet might be the most effective way to lower blood pressure without using medications. The DASH diet is simple. Choose vegetables, fruits, low-fat dairy, whole grains, chicken, fish, and nuts, while minimizing the consumption of sweets, sugary drinks, and fatty cuts of meat. It's high in fiber, high in lean protein, and packed with nutrients. And as an added bonus, when we follow the DASH diet, we're also more likely to increase our intake of potassium through potassium-rich foods like spinach, bananas, peas, and beans. But why is that a bonus? Well, potassium helps to lower our blood pressure. It balances out our sodium levels while encouraging the walls of our blood vessels to relax. Its powerful effects is one of the reasons why I include it in microvitamin, but just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. The third key strategy to lower blood pressure is to add in exercise. Now I know how difficult it can be to get started, especially if you've been relatively inactive, or if life just gets in the way. So I've got my patients at the clinic to look after, I've got this YouTube channel, I'm looking after my three kids at home, so yes, we're all busy, but the good news is that even small changes can make a positive impact. So I encourage my patients to start where they are and look for ways to add movements into their schedules. So I recommend that they try exercise snacks, which are short bursts of physical activity that you can sprinkle in through your day. They're like mini workouts instead of a long training session. So instead of carving out a 30 minute chunk of time to hit the gym, for example, you might do a few sets of wall squats between meetings. So I do an exercise snack during my 15-minute paperwork break at the clinic. 
Finally, for overweight individuals, weight loss is so powerful in reducing blood pressure. So one study found that the greater the weight loss, the greater the reduction in blood pressure. So if our weight is above target despite trying to optimize our lifestyle factors, we can consider medications such as Ozempic to help on our weight loss journey. Taking medications is not a failure, it's just another tool to help reach your health goals. And finally, if our lifestyle factors are dialed in, our weight is perfect, and we've still got a blood pressure of above 120, then I have a discussion with my patients about the pros and cons of blood pressure medications. I emphasize that medications are definitely not a replacement for any of the lifestyle factors that we've already gone through. And while medications are sometimes necessary, most of us would like to reduce our blood pressure as much as possible without having to resort to medications. We need to be strategic about the lifestyle changes to maximize their benefits. And when it comes to exercise, a recent study has pinpointed a surprisingly simple exercise that lowers blood pressure more than other types of exercise. So make sure to check out this next video here to discover what it is and how you can easily do this exercise at home.